building downtown. Building downtown. Building hey, yo, it's the building downtown. You can follow us on social media at the building DT. You can follow and subscribe to the show on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm your host, Jason Kelly. You can follow me at J Kelly MMA. You can follow my co-host Krill, Krill Kasatsky at Krill Raps and my other co-host Amy Barton at Ames Bell. Tonight, we got a goddamn Canadian hip-hop veteran isn't even the right word used for this guy, especially on the Ontario scene. I was thinking about it the other day. As, as, I, as far as I know, I've known this guy for a long time. He was rapping in, like, early, mid-90s. We're in the 2020s. That's a career that spans four fucking decades. Not many people could say that in any genre of music. Justin Hamilton, how's it going, my man? What's up, man? I'm good, man. I'm really good. Thank you for that intro. Yeah, buddy. Yes, you deserve it. You earned it. You've been putting on for this uh, this country, this province, and the Waterloo region for, like, you're a motherfucking Long pioneer time. around here. Long yeah. time. I like that word, pioneer. Thank you. <laughs> so let's let's go back to that, actually. Like, you were making music before fucking Napster was a thing, before the boom of the internet. Nowadays, yeah. nowadays people can make music with their garage band or this program and these filters and shit. How were you pressing up music back then? What was what were you using to record? Like, were you using a studio? Did you have something set up at home? What um, was uh, it was an actual studio, but um, the equipment was limited. But we focused solely on a program and the mic. Mm-hmm. And once we had that, we would uh, we would send the raw files to like um, like a bigger studio. And that's when like the mixing and mastering would take place. And then we would get the master copy back on a disc and, um, uh, well, there wasn't USB. It was more like, um, I don't know what you would call it. It was like, it it was like a, it was like a reel. Yeah. It was like, it was like a, it was like a reel that you would use on a cassette, but it wasn't a cassette. Yeah. Yeah. But I've something like a before. something like a project like a projector. It looked yeah. like it was one of those things in school. So we, that's what we got back as a master. Um, wow. So we we took that and the CD to a place in Toronto, and they did what they did to get it onto CD, um, which was expensive. I mean, for like five hundred CDs, it was almost like thirteen hundred bucks. Holy shit! Yeah. So I mean, we had to like minus like the giveaways and the stuff like that. Um, we really had to hustle. It was like selling dope, but just a different form, right? <laughs> That's exactly what it was like. Yeah. And, you know, you were pushing those mixtapes. Basically, like you hear those old school rappers say, you know, push mixtapes out of the trunk of the car. I mean, not yeah. the trunk of the car, but, you know, Cameron High School hallways and shit like that. Trying yeah. to pump mixtapes out. I was actually just telling somebody that the other day. I said, you know, like I took a hiatus from music because obviously I had to go through like um, all my recovery and all that stuff with the dope issue. But um, mm-hmm. I said, like, I had to like relearn everything. I had to learn about like digital. I had to learn about social media, marketing ads, like Facebook ads, where to place ads, when to, when to, um, like, uh, to set a time for them to be, um, uh, available for people to see. Like I had to study mm-hmm. analytics and stuff because that's where the world was. I said, I'm from the era where we put a hundred mixtapes in a box and we went to revolution <laughs> on Friday night and we waited until last call. So like 2 AM we pulled up and we just pressed play and leaned against the car, hoping someone to stop. But, and you know, that's how we chopped them back then. And then the next night we'd go to like, um, the, um, Fiddler's green in Cambridge. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we'd be out there at last call, just press play, and 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 that's how we hustled the CDs back then. There was no um, Spotify and YouTube and all that stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So, is this, know, is this, yeah, is this before just another hustle or, or during or? It was before just another hustle. It was queued up records time. Yeah, damn, that was a long time ago. Like, and that I was, was that was GJ Pittman, right? Double J. Yeah. That's crazy. That, and uh, he was he was popping for a while too. And I know a couple of years ago he released like a compilation album. But yeah. uh so you, you were working with him quite a bit back then, right? Him, were you working with ProLogic at that time too? Um or no, not yet? not yet, because him and ProLogic had their little tiff. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. And um I actually didn't know ProLogic like um like JJ did, but mm-hmm. I was kind of like just a soldier at the time. So JJ's like, yo, I need you to write a verse about this guy. Oh. So I was so I was just like, all right. And then it got to Pro Logic. And then I got cornered by like him, Sean McDay or Fraction, you know. Yeah. Um, there was like a couple other beatdown guys there. And yeah. I was like, they're like, yo, we heard that song, man. We're gonna smash you. And I was like, Oh, I didn't realize this. I, like, you know, J because JJ was just kind of like, yo, you're the hot thing right now. You got this freestyle buzz, mm-hmm. and uh, you can also write. So that was kind of like my first taste of like rap beef gone wrong. 
no shit. I didn't even know there was rat beef in this this region. <laughs> yeah. That's it was, crazy. It was bad. Um, because I remember one of the lines in the song was like, um, uh, something, something, no bluffing. We do it harder than fraction and low budget. Oh. And, and that was his label or whatever, right? So uh -huh. all of a sudden, um, one night at Sammy's, it was just not the right time for me to leave. Oh. Ho. So uh, I got spared because somebody on pro side knew me and was like, yo, let me holler at this guy and kind of like see what's going on here. Cause I was like, yo, I don't know you. I just, you know, I just got picked up by this guy. He asked me to do this. And they're like, yo, but you, you need to like vet things before you can't just jump on something and start doing something. So it was a lesson learned. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it could have been a lot worse too. You think you like, think of places like fucking Compton when that goes down, you definitely could die over that shit. Fuck not that far away in Toronto. You're seeing it more and more, more and more. Yeah, man. Like um, my nephew, actually, he was friends with, or he's friends with, uh, I guess the new hot thing out there, a guy named top five or something. Okay. I've never heard um, of him. He's a he's a big YouTube thing. Okay. Um, but uh, we were at a barbecue in the summer, and we left the barbecue. And the next day, my nephew, I woke up to my nephew crying. He's because one of his brethren was just popped at the complex we were at. Wow. Just for being affiliated with this top five guy. Holy shit! So I was kind of like, I never had to deal with anything like that uh, with music, but I've dealt with it in other things, right? So. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's the thing too. Like I said at the start of this, like, we've known each other for a long time, and long time. I've never known you to be that like uh, that asshole to go around looking for trouble. We've known lots of those guys. We've had mutual friends like that. Yeah, but yeah. I've never <laughs> known you to be that dick. So, um, did that? Did that? Was that a lesson that helped you move a certain way within the music industry? Because on the street shit, you know what you're getting into, but you must have been completely yeah. guard. No, it's a good question, man. Because. It was from that moment on, I was like, yo, I'm not just gonna, like, I realized what it's like to kind of be a puppet without realizing it, right? Um, Because hmm. JJ had a personal vendetta and has this new hot buzz in the city because uh, he had Devo at the time too, but Devo oh, wasn't, yeah. Devo, Devo and I had an issue because of a guy named Jeff Lyle. Holy shit. Uh, yeah, so um, that goes all the way back to Cameron. So me and Devo squashed our stuff. This thing happens with ProLogic and Pro and I like, we would be at the same place, but we wouldn't really mingle with each other. Mm -hmm. But eventually we kind of grew up. Um, and it did, in fact, shape the way I navigated through anything, like even with promoters and stuff. And they were like, yo, um, I'm going to give you 50 tickets and this many flyers and this and this and that. And then they'd be like, yo, if this guy asks you to buy tickets, though, don't sell it to him. So I'd have what? to be like, well, why would you not want me to sell this guy tickets? And then I'd be like, yo, I can't do that. Like, because I'm mutual friends with this person. Um, I don't know if you remember a guy named Raheem. Do you remember Raheem? No, not off the top of my head. He brought a lot of the acts like Baby Sham and uh, Lloyd Banks and and them to to hear Ultimate Entertainment. I okay. think. Okay. Okay. Yeah, he he kind of put me in that position, and I I had to push back, and I was like, well, I, I don't even want to do this show if there's already a problem with me being told not to sell tickets to people. Yep. The, the point is you want to sell tickets <laughs> no, yeah no shit <clears throat> absolutely and if there's if there's a problem that already tells you that there's a problem right yeah. there's, there's going to be some sort of issue because what if you don't sell them tickets they can go somewhere else and get them exactly right and then and then you're especially if you're cool with you know both sides then you're in a fucked up position i'm i'm you know what I, that's been my luck pretty much my whole career i was always known on both sides of the fence yeah <clears throat> and sometimes it was tough like we did an ob trice show in toronto at the rock pile Mm -hmm. and we got put on before him and there was a guy that was friends with the promoter from toronto that all of a sudden like i don't know who he called but like 20 20 dudes deep just showed up and they were like ready to ride on us and it's like because why because the promoter saw us more fit to be the hype act before obi trice Holy you know what shit. i mean so then i had to talk to the promoter and be like listen like the last thing I want is to be in a city. I'm not com like, I don't know this territory. Mm -hmm. All I know is I know a couple of these guys are holding something because they haven't taken their hands out of their pocket. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So even then it was just like, just because of performing, there was a problem in this industry. So I had to start being very selective with promoters. Mm -hmm. um, and then the summer jam thing, that was, that was good. But then behind the scenes, again, there was, problems <laughs> yeah i heard that there, there's all kinds of shit going on behind the scenes with that event you're talking with one of bingamans right 
Yeah, like um, people wanted to know who the connect was, and they were like blowing up my phone. They're like, "Yo, we're, don't make me send mans to your door," like because they're trying to get put on. And I'm like, "It's not my position to hand yeah. over a name of somebody who has entrusted me in the confidence that I wouldn't do that." Yep. So now you guys want to ride on me because I, I'm I'm staying loyal. Yeah. Right? Just that, so much nonsense, man. <laughs> that was a good look, too. Like, how do you align yourself to get in position for that? Because that had friggin' what, um, like local talent. There was like you, Step, Era, some other people. But then at the top of that that card, there was like Busta, T Pain. Yeah. Uh, was Fabulous there? Fabulous was Fabulous there, and right? Rick Ross. Yeah, man. That fucking that was crazy. Yeah. Um, how do you align yourself to get those opportunities? uh word of mouth usually and some like no it's not what you know it's who you know right so Mm. somebody would say oh if you want to move tickets in kitchener talk to justin Uh, who's justin uh blah blah blah. they you know they give him a mixtape or something and then all of a sudden they'd hear the music and be like yo tell this guy to come to my apartment Mm -hmm. so i would go to the i went to this apartment up on like columbia university area there okay and it was just some university kid that had all this money that was putting the show on Holy shit. So he was like, look, I'll give you this many tickets. If you sell this ticket for this price, here's what you make. If you sell this package, this is what you make. And if you can sell these ones, which include backstage, meet and, meet and greet, mm-hmm. this is your cut. And I was like, done. And then when I chopped them in like a week, he was like, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. So then that's when he's like, you know what? I want to put you guys on first because we can get you publicity. We can get you in the record. I still have the newspaper clipping actually nice. from it. So that's usually how things like that happened back then. It was just somebody knew someone and said something about me. Yeah, and you uh, shortly, er- like fairly early in your career, you were um, collaborating with people, especially from Toronto. Uh, Julie Black, I know you've had a relationship with for a long time. Without yeah. moving outside of Waterloo Region, like, is do you have to go develop yourself somewhere else, even if it's like a Toronto or the other side of the border or something like that? Is is there? It would be damn near impossible to just gain any sort of success and get your name out there if you just stayed stuck in this region. Yeah, yeah it would figure. be because there there wasn't. We had a scene, but it was like like flash in the pan, right? Yep. Um, it wasn't until people started bringing you to like London, to Hamilton, uh-huh. to Toronto, because then they'd be like oh, we know all these guys. Who's these guys from Kitchener? Mm -hmm. And then me, I thrived on the performance because that's the best part of my whole entire talent is performing because that's the, that's, that's my passion. That's, that's my heartbeat. Right. Mm -hmm. So once I got off stage, it literally was like, I need to stay in contact with this guy because if he can do this to a crowd and he's not even from this city, Mm -hmm. then there's something special about this guy. That's nine out of 10 times. That's what happened, Jason. Wow. It was, the performance led me to be in contact with someone from that city. Hmm. Even though I was at home <laughs> after the show. <laughs> so and very early on when you were doing like local places, um, was that kind of just like uh, knocking on doors? Like, Hey, can we, can we do a spot Friday night, whatever, whatever. We yeah. Want? Yeah. Yeah. That was just doing the yellow pages, cold calling style. Really? Yeah, funny two words, yellow pages. Because <laughs> you'd, you'd, you'd want to find, we all knew the spots, but we didn't know the phone number. Yeah. So, okay, I want to call stages. I know how to get there, but I don't know if anyone's going to be there. So you have to go through the yellow pages and find someone. And the owner usually had someone in place for that stuff. Really? So it was um, common then? Yeah. So like inner city was very open to it. Stages was tougher. Sammy's was a definite no. Mm. um and then you had the other place like the basement um i think we did wax once too and that was even tough because they're kind of giving up a night where they kind of base it on liquor and party people yep versus like oh some local hip-hop act and then you realize when you know 100 people walk in they're like oh okay we didn't know that this was gonna happen yeah (laughs) (laughs) so that's how that went back then what's your favorite venue you've played so far what was the best crowd, local or elsewhere? Um, well, that's a good question. I would have to say Niagara Falls. Oh, yeah? What was the place called? Um, I know that it's called Seven now, but I forget what it was called back then. Uh, I just know the building, but um, it was just electrifying because you ha- it's a border city. So everyone mm. was there to party no matter what. Yeah. 
it wasn't like people were like, oh, what are these guys doing? I didn't come here to hear rap tonight, you know, like, because you always had those people that were like regulars or locals that, you know, they would just hate on you as soon as you got there. But Niagara Falls was just, I think it was the age era too, because you had a lot of 19 year old and a lot of the 19 year olds were from the States. Mm -hmm. I remember got, partying, yeah, partying at Niagara Falls when I was like 19, 20 and uh, people from yeah. the States would be there because you, you only have to be 19 to drink, right? Yeah. So over there, they got to be 21. So yeah. the majority of the crowd was that. And Americans are patriotic um, to begin with. So mm -hmm. they didn't know who we were. We just sounded good. <laughs> <laughs> what's the uh, what's the worst rejection you've got trying to show someone your music? Oh. And not even necessarily bad, because I've like I I like, I've been doing like this kind of me media in some format now for like ten years, and like back when I was doing combat sports stuff, like I remember somebody said the one time they posted on for social media or whatever, if I ever meet Jason Kelly, I'm gonna cut his fucking face because I said something I wrote something about BJ Penn. I get a oh, kick wow. out of this shit. Yeah, yeah, I get a kick wow. out of this. Yeah, man. Um, that was it. Was me? I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you just say it to me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I get a there. kick at it, right? Like it's like fucking, you know, like that's. I'm not digging for like you know something heartbreaking, but it, it's 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 part of the territory. Not everyone's gonna like what you do, right? You, I'd have you, to say, you, I'd have to say, Cardinal. Oh shit, really? Yeah, that got that had to sting a bit. It did because it was at Shaw Claire's birthday party, and I knew that I was going there. So what I did was I just put together like uh, like a three track demo mm -hmm. with obviously our song on it, and uh, when I was going to give it to him. He, he literally looked at me he's like what do you want me to do with this man he's like I'm, oh and i was like yeah i just wanted you to hear it maybe we could do something together and he's just like you're lucky to be standing here man like i don't you know Whoa. give it to this guy so i was just like i was like damn what i don't know asshole. i don't know i don't know what happened to you before you got to this place in brockville or wherever we were yeah, yeah. brockville but um that, yeah that it stung because it's someone <clears throat> that i had looked up to definitely especially when like we were doing the queued up thing. He was just really shaping Toronto and the whole, he had that, uh, that Caribbean style of rap, right? Yeah. It was half Patois, half Canadian. Um, but hustling was the, the joint that he came up with at mm -hmm. the time. I remember that. So from that song to this birthday party, um, I've always looked up to him and admired him, but then, I mean, I, I'm not, I, I'm not going to be salty about it, but it did sting at first. I was like, for sure man i don't uh, yeah whatever that sucked <laughs> <laughs> and someone like him too you think that he would know like you said you know he was he's at like right around that time he's shaping and molding the the, the hip-hop culture and scene in toronto yeah. he had to have known what it's like in in toronto canada ontario wherever it may be you, you know you're not you're not in brooklyn there's yes. not just tons of MCs, right? Like there's not a huge buzz like that. So he had to have came through some of the same struggles because before that, what do we have? Fresh West? That was a whole different thing. Let your backbone slide shit. Yeah. <laughs> thing, right? That's the, it's not like, uh, well, West still makes music and it's way more um, hip hop than like that dance type, let your backbone slide type shit. But uh, yeah. so card now, right? Like there's not like there was a lot of people before him. He must have ran into tons of roadblocks. You would think that, you know, this kid comes up to him, you know, fucking just wants to do something wants to show someone he respects a legend whatever like that and maybe yeah. possibly work with him and to get shut down like that it's fucking rude yeah it stung and then it just changed my view of him like he makes good music regardless but the personal level of him i just like I, sometimes i hear his name and i'm just like yo whatever that guy's a punk <laughs> <laughs> oh shit how did you uh how did you link up with Shaw Clary? Because you guys had that track with Rufus, you and Rufus and him a few years back. How did you first link up with him? Um, oh, I was in jail with this guy named Robbie G. And mm, from Guelph? Yeah, from Guelph. Me, okay. Yeah, get this. Me, him, and Scars. You know Scars and Clue, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me, him, and Scars were on the same range. Holy shit. This is nuts. And then I got out first. Scars got out after me. And then Robbie G got out. And then Robbie G, he remembered my email. So he huh. used my email to find me on Facebook. And then he was like, yo, remember remember me from Range 8A? And then we were up on 6C together, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. What's up, the white boy from Guelph? And he's like, yeah. He's like, yo, I got a couple shows. If you think you can um, help me like with the sales and stuff. So we just did a couple shows. Um, this was like just around the Just Another Hustle era. 
Okay. Um, so Step D and Dizzy were rolling with me. Um, and then he did this Canadian diabetes tour with Shaw Claire. Okay. And I was like, oh, he's like, yo, if you want to do this show, uh, you can do the Guelph show. Kitchener's already booked, but then you can do the, the London show or Strathroy or something like that. Yeah. So we did the Guelph show. And after I stuck around, like just hanging out, not like groupie style or anything, but just like smart navigation. Yeah. Like nine out of 10 chances are Shockler is probably going to go back there to, to smoke a drink or whatever. Yeah. So I just kept talking to this <clears throat> uh, person that worked at the club. And then lo and behold, he's like, oh, I got to go unlock this door. I just got a text and he unlocked it. And then here comes Shaw Clear with his manager and someone else and, and Robbie G. So he's like, yo, Justin, what's up, man? Yo, come hang out with us. And then I just talked to Shaw Clear from there. And he, um, at first he was like, he's like, yeah, I'm always down to do stuff and give back and everything like that. And he gave me his manager's number. And um, so we hung out till about maybe 3 or 4 a.m. in Guelph. We came back to Kitchener. But, like, within three weeks of that show, it was Beatoberfest with him and Chaos. Okay, yeah, yeah. At, at the auditorium. Yeah. So I remember when he arrived, he was walking through the crowd and getting ushered to where his dressing room was. And I just remember yelling, Shiznock! And he looked over and he, like, squinted his eyes. He's like, Justin, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, Guelph, right? I'm like, yeah. He's like, yo, come on. Oh, shit. Yeah, so he came with us. And then his manager's like, yo, here's the knock code so we know it's you. And it was like, knock, knock, three seconds, knock. <laughs> and, yeah and uh they gave me the code and then chocolate wanted to go uh have a cigarette and he's yeah. like yo well, where can i go have a smoke and i remember just being like yo I'll, I'll show you where you can go smoke just follow me man it's like this people are sketchy here or whatever and we got outside and chocolate's like yo are you like the guy around here I'm like, <laughs> i don't know and his manager's like yo this shit just parted everyone just parted as soon as they saw you walking and i was Ooh. like I, I didn't even notice and they're mm-hmm. like I think that just kind of made them like, okay, this guy is a little bit different than what we thought, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I actually had the chance to talk with Shaw Claire before he had to perform. And uh, I, he didn't have a hype man. So I was like, yo, let me go on stage and be your hype man. He's like, no, nah, I like to perform by myself. And his manager's like, how can you be his hype man, man? Blah, blah, blah. And I literally, his song, Who That Is, yeah. I started quoting that from beginning to end. Oh, and, shit. And Shockler, yeah, no, no, no. He didn't let uh, me go, but Shockler looked at me and he was like, yo, it's the first time something like that's happened. Holy shit. Yeah, because I was literally like, people studied me so hard, I guess that's why they hate it, but don't mm-hmm. understand, don't need me later on to make it. <laughs> I got the bar high, I gave these niggas hop. Yeah, and then he was just like, whoa, like this is a fan. You know what I mean? And um, when that happened, he had given me a cell phone number. He was actually going to come back to mine and Step's house on Huber. We lived over on Huber by TJ's. Okay. And uh, it didn't happen, but he was like, listen, if you, I'm down to make a song, blah, blah, blah. And so um, I stacked up my chips. I gave him a call. I was working at the Charcoal Steakhouse. Mm-hmm. And he was like, yeah, man, blah, blah, blah. He said he was going to keep his manager out of it because his manager was kind of like his prices were high and he, was, he understood I had a budget. But yeah. um, I ended up uh, taking the Greyhound to Toronto and cabbing to uh, PHS Sound Lab at Eastern and Broadview. And uh, Shockler was outside uh, about to smoke a spliff when I got there. And huh. I, I hopped out the cab and that was kind of like, I, I was really nervous, man. I just, it was a different type of, like I'm confident enough in my talent and my gift of music, but mm-hmm. Like, dude, I saw you on much music when I was supposed to be in fourth period in high school. Yeah. You know what I mean? And now I'm standing shoulder to shoulder with you in your city, about to go into the studio with your producer and your crew. And yeah. it was it was surreal. And when I got in there, um, everybody just had, like, this positive, awesome vibe. There was no negativity. There was no hard niggas or anything like that. It was just oh, business. And... Um, he spit his verse for me and asked me if, if that was going to be okay for the record. I was like, Gee, I'm featuring you, man. You can, you can just mumble, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so we, we made that record. It was a really awesome night because um, he had really gone into uh, the details to his career. And I didn't know how, how impactful ice cold was. Like he met method and method man and red man, because they were number one with their blackout album. Yeah. They were number one everywhere except for Canada because they were behind Shaw Claire. Holy shit, I didn't know that. That's how they knew who Shaw Claire was. So wow. he was in a club in LA and someone said, yo, Shaw Claire from Canada's here, and they beelined for him. 
And they gave wow. him nothing but props and respect because they were like, yo, we didn't even know Canada had MCs. Like, because America, you know, a lot of them are ignorant. Let's just yeah. be honest. <laughs> yeah. Amy knows. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he was filling me in on this. And then he was filling me in on meeting Madonna because um, apparently he had like a glimpse of number one. And then Madonna like catapulted past him. Wow. But even her manager was like, who's Shaw Claire and who's Let's Ride? That's insane. And That's it crazy. was, it, that it was, the... was massive here. You yeah. know, what I mean? it, it, like coming, like being from here, like you're not delusional, but you figure it at least has a buzz in the States and not even eh? yeah. And uh, Madonna was like, um, Madonna's manager had called hunted down Shockler's manager and wanted like, wanted to know who this guy was because all of a sudden it's like Madonna's single and his single, like he was number one for that week. Crazy. And yeah. So Madonna was like number two. And that even is... that right there, like when he was sharing that with me, I was just kind of like, I was even more grateful to be on this record with him. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, at the end of the night, we, we hung out, he took me out to eat at this uh, place that was open all night long. And it was more like, it went from like artist, artist to like big brother, little brother type thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's gotta be valuable too, learning from someone like that having them take you under their wing because you know it's valuable for like anyone from anywhere but having because he's he's right on the heels of cardinal like we were talking about shaping and yeah. molding the hip-hop culture of toronto chocolate was right there with cardinal yeah and um when the record went to the beat uh i remember dj flash he played it specifically when mr d walked in and okay. mr d was like yo is that chocolate's new joint or something and he's like no it's just incredible and mr d remembered me from Beatoberfest. And he was like, like, Justin, like, our Justin? Like, Kitchener Justin? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> so he put it on the beat showdown, but I, I didn't get the heads up because they don't give you a chance to, like, go tally up votes, right? Yeah. And um, someone called me and told me, like, yo, you're the challenger tonight. And I was like, what? They're like, yo, your record this dream with Rufus and Chocolair. And I was like, huh? Like, I, I was <laughs> half asleep. And then I, I went to the, the radio to 91.5 The Beat, and it was just at the end where they announced us beating Pitbull and Kesha. Whoa. And so I hit up Shaw Claire with a tweet. And uh -huh. Shaw Claire, like, he called my cell phone and was like, what's what's going on with the radio? I said, bro, our song was just on Beat Showdown uh, at 9 o'clock. It's like this uh, one-hour slot where, you know, we were the challengers against last night's champions based on votes. And after that, Shaw Claire even though I had paid him for his feature, he was like, like he wanted to endorse it that much more because the beat isn't a small platform, man. Yeah. And the next night we went up against Bieber. When we beat Bieber, he literally took that record to whoever he knew possible in Toronto. And it's the first time I started realizing how successful one song can make you. Can make you. Because I started getting emails from like 107.5 in Vancouver, 91.7, The Bounce in oh, Edmonton. Shit. Like I'm getting these emails are just like, your song's been added to our playlist. You you are the top five at five drive with Daryl something. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm at work having a smoke break, checking my Gmail. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm in the kitchen. I'm all dirty chef style. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm number one on top five somewhere in Edmonton. Like, it's it what time is it in Edmonton you know what I mean because it's like nine o'clock here and I just it, yeah it did what it was supposed to do and then Rufus he did what he was supposed to do with it too and uh I got a taste of royalties and honestly um I I uh it's a it's a bittersweet um situation because my daughter was just born mm -hmm. and I was I was at pretty much the end point of either my life or this stupid uh love affair with cocaine so mm -hmm which one are you going to give up and which one are you going to pursue like being a dad and cleaning yourself up or signing this record contract that just came my way because uh there was a guy by the name of lawrence fisher okay. who played in the cfl and he had worked for as an intern for some some a and r in universal music uh canada and i had got a a mail from pure later with a publishing contract and a recording contract the publishing contract was like eight pages of lawyer lark i don't understand what this stuff says yep and the record contract was 35 pages holy shit 
And the I language remember, you don't understand at all yeah, for the most part, right? I yeah. remember seeing something jump out about 80% creative control, uh, masters owned by, and $50,000 advance. That's the only three things I remember seeing. Mm-hmm. So I had called my sister and my sister had given me um, over to her friend, Daryl, who is an entertainment lawyer. He actually deals with like the actors and actresses and stuff when they come to Toronto. Oh, cool. So he said, you know what? This is usually what I charge, but because your sister's your sister, like my people, I'll do mm-hmm. this pro bono. And he had sat me down and explained everything I needed to know. He basically was like, look, if this is your dream and you want it bad enough, sign the dotted line. You're going to get a check. They're going to expect you to have an album within six, six to 12 months. Even at six to 12 months, you can hand in that those tracks, but because it's 80% your control, 20% their control of creative content, that 20% buys the window for them to say, no, nah, we're kind of thinking a direction like Jake. So Drake, go back and you know change these records. Yeah. But then you're going to have to do that with your own money. Oh. And then he said, the fact that they own your masters means they can keep you on the shelf for another 18 months before they feel fit to promote you. And for that 18 months, you can't do anything elsewhere because you'll be uh, tarnished, tarnish, whatever the term is, tar- tarnishing the contract. Wow. Because you're their property. And then That's they can crazy. drop you from the label because they just don't see it fit. You could be driving on the 401 to come visit your sister and hear your song on the radio and not one penny is coming your way. Oh, that's so rough. He said, This is the problem where so many young, talented guys they sign their life away because they see the big five digits. Yeah. And uh, he said, But thankfully, you have a sister who, you know, reached out to me. She said, uh, My brother's stuck. He's been doing this his whole life. This is what he wants. And the same day that he gave me that news, I went home because I was kind of like, I don't want anybody owning my music. I don't want anybody yeah. telling me how to write songs or anything like that. Like, no wonder Jay-Z was on that promotion of Own Your Masters, right? So mm-hmm. I went through all that, and I felt really depressed. And then the phone rang, and they had a bed for me at this place called uh, the Newport Treatment Center okay. in Port yeah, Colburn. Newport. Newport Treatment Center in Port Colburn, Ontario. Okay, That's like a jail, bro. They don't allow you to smoke. They don't allow you to go out. Yeah, so um, I went there. And they had sent me to the hospital because I had a, a, a psychosis. I didn't know what the heck psychosis was, but because my brain wasn't getting coke anymore, it started Jesus. going it started going wonky and like I was snapping on stupid stuff. And they sent me to the psych ward in Kitchener, and they actually said if you don't show up by this time, there's going to be a bench warrant for your arrest because you're high high risk or whatever. Wow. So I had to take this mega bus <laughs> back to Hamilton, Hamilton to Kitchener, and then Kitchener to Granville Hospital. And okay. all of this was literally at the end of, well, actually the peak of the, the record taking off. And a lot of people kind of said, you know, that's probably one of the dumbest decisions you could have made. And at first I allowed it to get in my head and think that. And I was like, yeah, but had I gone a certain way, who knows if I'd even be alive because that lifestyle, drugs and alcohol and everything go hand in hand, man. Mm-hmm. I, and it yes. was just, it was just, um, it wasn't, it wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know, you're catching a buzz, making money, and then you see you start doing more shows and you get more access and bigger crowds and the money keeps coming. And if you already have that addiction, it's just going to fuel the fire even more. Yeah. And yeah, I that's um, a disaster. Yeah. So that's uh, it's nice that I got the chance to talk about it now because I wouldn't have been able to before, but it's seven years ago, right? So when I look back at it, it's almost like the song still solidified who you are. And if anything, the song played a major part in people understanding the fact that Justin Hamilton is beyond just this rapper. He's an actual mm-hmm. artist. Because I wrote the hook. A lot of people don't know that. They hear Rufus singing, but I, I wrote it and hummed it to Rufus. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, shit. And still gave Rufus 50% of the royalties. <laughs> <laughs> That's looking up for your boy right there. Yeah, because Rufus and I, we've been making music since, like, the, the whole time you've been talking about from before, cue it up. Like, mm-hmm. we had that song on my album, like, This Ain't No Game. Like, mm. that song was big. And... You know, I told Rufus, he's like, why are you giving me 50%? I'm like, I paid you for your voice, man. Yep. You know? So, yeah. 
Yeah, Rufus has had a good, a good career in his own too. Um, yes, he has. Yeah, very good career, much success, and uh, he was on. How far did he go in Canadian Idol? He didn't win, right? No, but he. I think he was at like the top ten round. Yeah, yeah. He. I know he made it deep into Canadian Idol. It's funny because I went to school with Rufus from like Blue grade. Hill. Yeah, yeah, and even grade seven, eight. Uh, he's a year younger than me, so he came to Margaret when I was in grade eight. So and then all through Blueville, we went to school together. And I remember finding out like sometime in high school that he sings. And you know, you're a punk ass teenager. I'm listening to that Tupac and NWA and Ice Cube and like <laughs> he sings. The fuck you mean he sings? Men don't sing. Yeah. Uh, you know, then you grow up, become an adult, and you're like, yo, that kid can fucking sing. Oh man, he's it amazes me to watch him work too, because we never did songs where it was like he sang the hook and sent it to me over email. What do mm-hmm. you think? It was like we were in there together. Yeah. You know, um, even the song um uh my love gone um where he has like all of us on there yeah like he, he has like dice on there he's got fraction on there he's got me on there uh pro logics on there um you know it was a big record and, mm-hmm. and unfortunately we couldn't shoot the video because there was too much ego oh. and it was the younger cats like uh, uh lex marcello and dice giovanni or something they had some issue and they go yo if this guy's on the set it's gonna pop off and rufus is literally like yo i'm paying for the video for one yeah. <laughs> no shit so it, it didn't go but to be in the studio with him when he was like writing his hook and then asking me questions and insight um you know that's the difference of like when you hear a rufus justin collaboration you know it's like it's gonna be good because mm-hmm. we go to our artist zone mm-hmm. um it's, it's not just like the whole feature feature thing like yeah uh how did uh how did you get because part of that video with you him and chocolate shot in waterloo how the hell did you get chocolate to come to waterloo yo i paid him oh really oh okay yeah. okay he, he had a he had a video fee and again his manager was like all over me and i was like oh my gosh and chocolate is like yo honestly if you just do it for this much like i'll just t- like we, we just won't tell him the date you know what i mean mm-hmm. so Again, I was kind of like, whoa, like for you to, you know, step up to your manager like that. So his manager ended up saying, okay, I'll do it for, for like five bills or something, because his manager, obviously, instead of getting his 25% was getting his 10%. Oh, shit. <laughs> and um, yeah, Shockler came to where I, yo, know, pro, honestly, I, it just hit me right, again. He came to Kingswood and Blockline where I grew up. Yep. I know. He, he came there he didn't get on the camera there because i was like yo i'm gonna save it for when we're downtown yeah but just for him to show up uh-huh. when the motorbikes were there my sister was there my nephews were there like the people i grew up were there the moms and the dads and the, the people that have seen me since a little kid were there they were like yo this guy is actually here in the hallman buildings <laughs> the hallman buildings the oh, hallman shit. buildings i haven't heard the hallman buildings for the longest time <laughs> the hallman buildings on kingswood man no right good comes out of there no exactly <laughs> I'm, I'm living proof of that man uh, holy fuck i bought just about every kind of drug imaginable out of those fucking buildings yeah yeah so he, to, to even bring him there was just phenomenal but yeah he came and he hung out he actually came to shoeless joe's with us and then went oh, back shit. to my boy's house and partied with us nice so he's down to earth i think yeah he's down to earth man he went back to toronto uh he left at like i'd I'd say like midnight and then rufus and i had to go perform at tj's which was so Mm. awkward why that place that place just wasn't was it a hip-hop spot it was some oil wrestling night or something like (laughs) i don't know if you remember hearing about fowf or something here in kitchener no. Anyway, some guy started some female oiling wrestling thing. <laughs> what the fuck? And it was literally a ring with like. Uh, fuck did I miss that? Like Is oil. That the like, thing that uh, I think it was Fitz Vanderpool. He was like a judge in it or something. Yes. And he was doing some political stuff like a year or two ago, and that a picture came up from the past of him being a judge in like uh, oil wrestling, local oil wrestling. And they were like, "Oh, it's gonna ruin his political career." And I was yeah, like, yeah, what the fuck? yeah. Uh, remember That's that exactly. That's okay, exactly okay. what it was. That whole thing there. So they 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 had um they had a show at TJ's and then had asked us to come and perform there, and they paid mm-hmm. us. And I was like, well, I'm not going to turn down the money. But um, Rufus, we got there and I was Rufus was like, Yo, man, 
I don't know about this. I'm like, I know, right? He's like, like <laughs> he's like, this guy hasn't stopped staring at me since we got in here. And I looked at the bar and it was just, it must've been a regular, obviously, but it just, it just had that crocodile Dundee look. Yeah. <laughs> just some, some scruffy beard, freaking pissed off, angry beer drinking man <laughs> who was just like, what these coons want you know what i mean like <laughs> that's the look he had on his face not even joking man and, and as soon as i noticed it i was like i don't know about this either man but he already paid us in advance and now we gotta you know we gotta follow up the other half to get the other half mm-hmm. so we did the song and i remember rufus just walked outside and he's like i'm itchy <laughs> <laughs> One of the funniest things I've heard out of a human's mouth with only two words. I'm, I'm itchy. Oh, fuck. Yeah. That is hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. So, but like I asked you a little while ago about, you know, your favorite venue. You're talking about that one. What Have you played some other fucked up places too? Oh, yeah. Oh. The Grasshopper in Cambridge, man. That was a fucking dive. Oh, I know that place. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I don't know if it was just just the owners or, or who he lets in and doesn't let in, but it was just sketchy and shady. Yeah. That was always a crack dealing spot. And I remember it. like we were finished performing and I went to use the washroom and it was just like, like there was dudes just hanging out in the washroom. I was like, there's a smoke pit for this. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I, I, I just, and just like the smell and the, the bartender missing a tooth and, and just, <laughs> like, you know, do something. Get, like, I don't know. That's the Put, keepers, right? That's the keepers of Cambridge. Yeah, no shit. And I remember just, I wanted to leave. And oh, yeah, Step D was just, he was macking some girl, and I was like, Step, man, I'll leave you here, I don't care. Kitchener is just that way. He's like, dog, dog, come on, let's go back to their house and at least see what's popping. And I I just saw the opportunity to get out of Grasshopper. <laughs> we ended up in, like, Preston or Galt, one of the one of those oh, two. But, but it was just, we went into a building, the building, like, there was a cat in the hallway, you know, like, just... <laughs> It was just like the the carpet was just like that electric orange. Oh from like, shit! Like nineteen eighty one, you know, <laughs> and just, I, I yeah. But the grasshopper and that that whole night in one was just that. I will never. I told myself I'll never do that place again. I don't care what you pay me. Mm. And just the, came, the uh I don't know, man. I, I I don't know. Cambridge. It's it's always been that. As much as I holler try, as much as I holler try city, I always just like it's out of mercy. Oh, I have to shit. Say. I know. You, you, you can just say Twin Cities, right? That's, yeah. the crack, that's the crack capital of KW, man. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Preston. Oh my, Good old oh Preston. Yeah, my yeah. buddy told me one time a long time ago. I'll never forget this. Cambridge is the armpit of Ontario, and Brent, and Hamilton's the asshole of Ontario. Yeah. And it's like yeah, Cambridge is like a little Hamilton, and Hamilton's fucking not nice either. No. I have a couple ants there, and I've never liked visiting them. No, fuck no. All the one-way streets, it's fucking dirty. It's just fucking, it's just a terrible, terrible place. It's fucking rough in Hamilton, too. It's the first time yeah. I've ever seen somebody selling hard drugs on the corner. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, that was in Hamilton. Oh I was looking for gosh. weed, but he's just like, I just got hard. I was like, bro. What? <laughs> <laughs> for weed. I got, I got crack for you. I'm looking for some, some weed, you know what I mean? Completely opposite. Yeah, place. that's. That's nuts, man. I remember yeah, I was at an apartment. I was at an apartment. I think it was up on the mountain, but you were overlooking yeah. like the city, and it, the cloud was purple at nighttime. Oh yeah, oh, and oh, I remember yeah. just looking to my to my cousin. I'm like, yo, this is like Springfield in The Simpsons, eh? <laughs> Detroit, bro. It's Detroit. Oh my Detroit goodness. The other side. <laughs> yeah, man, oh. it's fucking dirty there. Like, yeah, shout out to everyone in Hamilton. Please keep yes. listening to the show. <laughs> <laughs> no, the bottom Yo, part is good, grimy. Did you do any shows in Hamilton? I could see that being problematic. Yeah, we did. Uh, what was the name of that place? It was on Upper James. Um, Louis Rankin, uh, God bless his soul. Oh, shit. Yeah, he, yeah. he was there, and he kind of was just throwing this celebration. So me, Step, and Dizzy, we went there, and we did our set and then it it was kind of like i don't think they like us anymore because the locals are now 
following us or the girls are flocking to us and those guys over there are supposed to perform next and they don't even look like they're heading to the stage mm. they're just like looking at us and that's why know, i asked because hamilton always gets grimy there had to be something mm-hmm. there yeah and then i remember we were with amir um amir was part of the promotion but even he was like yo did you guys just sense the vibe in here i'm like you think he's like yo why does this happen every time you guys get off stage i'm like because we're not from here and we're better than the guys who are from here so Mm -hmm. it turns into like that negative ego energy yeah that's what i call it right but if we didn't leave when we left we would have been part of some big stabbing and everything because definitely chairs started flying like we got the scoop the next day like chairs were flying the the owner like was so much thousands in debt just from the damage Holy shit. And it was all because, like, I don't know, some guy had the wrong pair of Nikes on. Who knows? Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, somebody's getting stabbed if shit's going down in Hamilton. Yep. Yeah. Um, like, even when I was a little kid, like, going to see my aunt there, like, my mom's sister, like, mm-hmm. like even my cousins were like, they were just a natural, rough, like, fa- like, they were just naturally rough kids. And it was just the environment. So, like, I'd go outside to play with them or whatever, and there was, like, kids that says, yo, what's up? Who are you, man? How you know this person? Oh, okay. I'm just checking, you know, because I haven't seen you around here before. I'm like, dude, we're eight. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> we're eight years old. Like, what type of checking do you need to do? Uh, how am I? Th- like, that's what I left there thinking every time, and I'd always beg my mom, like, I don't want to go to Hamilton because, like, <laughs> <laughs> it was just an environment that was in Kitchener, you know? I just dawned on me the irony of all this. Your fucking last name is Hamilton. Yeah. I just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Damn. Um, it sucks when you have that because, you know, from from teachers to police officers, once you say Hamilton, the, uh, Justin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you, you, know, you said, you mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, you had to relearn or not even relearn, learn all this, this different method of how music is put out there these days. Yeah. So you went to, you went to a treatment center to fix your life and get right and everything and yeah. cause a halt in the music. Was there a point during that period where you weren't even going to return to music? Yeah, there was actually. Wow. Um, because I had, uh, like my little girl, like, uh, Ava. Um, mm-hmm. so I would had my son and like, so let me see. He's, 24 32 so he was like eight years old and then Mm -hmm. i had like my daughter wasn't really expected um obviously i could have prevented that if i used rubber but (laughs) um, at least you take responsibility for it yeah it was just that gap in in age right so yeah i was like i'm just getting to the training wheels and going to the ranger games and stuff and now i'm going back to diapers and formula so i really had like just locked myself down to like focusing on finishing my uh, apprenticing for a chef and and staying certified in that. And, you know, thinking of RESP, like the stuff you don't think of in your twenties and teens. Yeah. And um, it wasn't until maybe my daughter was about five. I think it was around when she started (laughs) school. And I had bumped into someone. Let me think for a second. Hang on, hang on. So at OK's Tropical, the grocery store, I bumped into like a, a Guyanese man from my church. Mm-hmm. And he was like, he's like, oh, Clyde's son. I'm like, yeah. He's like, how you doing? I'm like, good, good. He's like, yeah. You know, your, your face popped up in, in my son's car the other day. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, yeah. The CD that I had many years ago. Mm-hmm. And I remember it was like, wow, you know what I mean? And then I don't know what it was. Like from that point on, everywhere I went and I bumped into someone I hadn't seen in years or someone from that old Coke lifestyle or something. Yeah. After the the small talk, yo, what's up? How you doing? Blah, blah, blah. Yo, you still making music? Everyone, <laughs> everyone, literally, I say this in all truth. Yeah. Everyone I bumped into said something regarding music or asked me about music. Oh, yeah, I, I completely believe that because picture like me and you've known each other for a long time. It's like we fucking hang out on a weekly basis. If I yeah. was to pop into you, not talking to you for a while, that'd be one of the first things I say to you. You still rapping? Yeah, and yeah, that's yeah, when it, it hit sense. me. It was like, and then I got home and I have this this quote on my mirror from Booker T. Washington. It's like, success isn't measured by where one stands. It's what he went through to get there. 
Uh-huh. And I looked at that as like success isn't measured by these material things. It's measured yeah. by what you struck, what you set out to do. And yeah. I, I remember um, I had this vision going back to like, I said one day, I said, everybody in Tri-City is going to know who Justin Hamilton is. I said it to, a, I think, a vice principal or something because I got suspended for rapping in class. <laughs> of and course you did. <laughs> here I am in my 30s, and it's literally like everybody I've bumped into in the last six months has said, music, how's the, you still? How's yeah. the, you still? <laughs> so I was like, you know what? Let's Let's do this. And then I remember I went to start writing and listening to beats again, and I was like, this isn't me like nothing made sense um i was listening to it and i was like i'm going too far i'm stretching too much truth like i'm creating an image i'm not anymore mm-hmm. or things that i'm no longer in agreement with yeah which means i've matured as a man and um i went to church one day because i was living with my sister in toronto and uh, the pastor had asked to speak to me after church and I don't know, you know, this is, it's one of the things that keeps me grounded in my faith in God is because he was like, you know, you have a gift and that gift is going to do what it's going to do, but you have to, you have to give that gift back to God and let him show you how to use it again. Huh. And, I, and I was like, okay, okay. And he's like, don't sugarcoat anything. Just make sure you're giving glory to where it needs to go. Okay. And that's when I was like, that's why nothing made sense. Cause I was glorifying the gangster crack dealing party. Negative things. With, yeah, and then when I was like, yeah, but nobody wants to listen to the, this bubblegum church stuff. And it was like, <laughs> that's not even what it's about. It's about you're telling your story as if you're a motivational speaker now. And you're going to try, try and direct kids a different way. You're not shoving it down their throat. You're not running around slapping people to the Bible telling them you're going to go to hell or else. You're just living what you were born in. I was born into Christianity. I ran from it. But now that you're an adult, it makes sense because it's not about the church and the prim and proper Sunday and all the proper fixings and the mingling. It's about your individual relationship with the Lord and mm-hmm. take it from there. And once I did that, it was like, I don't even write with pen and paper anymore. I can listen to a beat literally. And I just sit there and I just keep it on repeat. And eventually I'll have what I need to rap. And oh, my, my very first song was fatherhood blessed last year. When I huh. came up, when I came up with that song, that was the very first time I had publicly declared I'm making music again. Mm-hmm. And from June 2020 to March 2021, I have had more videos and more sh- like anything because it's you're living what you're supposed to live now. You're doing it the right way, and you're in control of this now. So learning how to do all this and everything gave me the chance to be an independent artist and understand what that means. Mm -hmm. You don't have a label gassing you up. You don't have somebody dragging you in five different directions. You can literally wake up, talk to a producer in the United Kingdom. He's like, yo, send me a bill. I'll send you these three beats right now since you were on my website. I'm like, oh, okay. Sends me the beats. And then all of a sudden it's just like, boom, boom, boom. I was going to ask how many, how many, uh, how many of the local guys participated in your last album? I heard a few tracks often. I actually heard a lot. Did anything you put out on Facebook anyways, I heard. Yeah. Um, nobody. Nobody? No Quanta, no ProLogic, nothing on there? Nope. No, no I, I wanted to go. I wanted to see the globe, man. Um, yeah. I wanted to represent it and stay true, but there's a certain sound that I like. And, mm-hmm. it, and the composition of music has to hit my heart. If it doesn't hit my heart, it's going to just put an idea into my mind of what should be on this beat. I don't want that to happen. So when I listen to a beat, it's got to be like, this needs to be said. Ah. And, and with, with the, you know, early, earlier on, obviously you're a kid, it's like, yo, I want money. I want some fame, maybe get some girls on the way. Now, yeah. like you're a different person now. You've matured, obviously <laughs> you, there's a, a big part of you, you. You have a faith that you believe in something. Is, are you looking to get something else out of the music now? Has, has, has the, those, have those goals changed? Um, the, the money aspect has changed. I don't care for that. Cause like, uh, I'm set from just being smart with it when I got to the age of 30 Yeah. On, and knowing that it wasn't too late. Um, you know, cause I did the office job nine to five and everything like I stacked up properly. Um, but now it's more about, I want to see the world and I want to change the thinking of the minds of young people nowadays <clears throat> without trying to change them. It's just, 
there's a lot of mass influence on these minds. And I just noticed it with like my nephews and stuff. Like even my son, he's 15. And sometimes I'm like, bro, I don't want you to hang out with that kid. Yeah. And he'll look yeah. at me and be like, why? And I'm just like, I'll tell you why. First of all, watch how he talks to his mother. Mm-hmm. You know, as soon as I say that to him, I'm like, next time you go to his house, I'm going to let you go to his house, but I want you to just observe how he talks to his mother. I said, any child that talks to his mother like that, I will have no respect for any human being, no matter what. Yeah, there's certain things you can definitely pick up on from life experiences, and especially some of the people that we've ran with over the years, right? You can think, yeah. That kid has that kid, that guy's trait. Fuck that. I don't want my son around that guy. because I Exactly. Exactly. And so now my, my, I'm starting to realize the impact because I'll have people call me. They're like, can you come talk to my son, please? Like my sister will be like, your nephew needs to come spend a week with you. My sister was never send her children to spend a week with me before. <laughs> I don't blame her. <laughs> Based on who I was, right? Yeah, but man. now she's like, listen, I can't take this. Your nephew, blah, 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 blah. I'm sending him for, for a week. I'm like, uh, okay. You know what I mean? And it's because she's at the point now where she's like, my, my little brother is going to straighten my son out. Mm-hmm. Because he's at that point now where he's, you know, I'm graduating high school. I can do what I want. I'm 18. It's like, yeah, that's true to a point. You're still under your mother's roof. That's the first thing I said to him, Mm -hmm. you know? So now it's about, I still love performing. I still pretend I'm I'm winning a Grammy in the showers, man. I'm a grown ass man. (laughs) That's awesome. You know what I mean? I'll grab, I'll grab wifey's, you know, herbal essence shampoo bottle. And I'll be making, (laughs) I'll be making my speech into the shower head as I'm looking at the crowd behind the curtains you know, and, and like, because that imagination is still there, that's not going to go away. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's the same, it's the same talent, the same gifts. It's just a different view now. And mm-hmm. it's a different dream. And that dream is, I still want to, I still want to know what it's like to go and perform. You know what I mean? Like show up in someone's city, see your name on like an arena or something and know that they're all there to see you. That's, that's pretty much what's driving me now. But unfortunately COVID is killing, killing everything. Now. Yeah. And um, being able to, uh, to use my platform to, to get into places just, just to, to speak, you know what I mean? Because when you get out of that rut of life, when you get out of an addiction, like such as what I had, you know, I know I'm going to be battling it for the rest of my life, but I had to learn a lot. I had to learn a lot about sacrifice. I had to learn a lot about honor. You know what I mean? Like it pisses me off that I got to pay for things right now you know, with this woman I'm, I'm dating and everything that I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. But it's because that little young man is still trickling in the immaturity is still trickling in. It's not about your money. It's, 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 it's your money. It's our money. Right. Yeah. So if you got a carrier for a bit, don't be walking around huffing and puffing because you have to pay her car insurance, man, be a man of honor. Yeah. You took care of your wife's car insurance. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. So that was, that was kind of like where I started realizing things are changing and with mm-hmm. that changing, so are the dreams and the desires I have now. Mm-hmm. and um i've gone to a few places to to speak to like young people whether it was like a youth night at like a, a church on a friday or something and you know one kid came out to me and he was like you know what i have a hard time listening to people when i have to sit here because my mom always sends me but you're not like the other people they send here to talk to us and i was like oh okay what do you mean he's like you look like what we listen to and you talk like what we we listen to yeah. but your message isn't the same message it's like I understand now I want to, and I was just like, I left, dude, I was, I was driving home and I started to cry. You know what I mean? Shit. Cause I was like, I was like, here's this 14 year old kid who literally dreads going to this youth group, but his mom keeps sending him because it's part of his behavior thing. And the one time I'm there for 45 minutes and just talked and hung out with them. He was like, I can connect with you because you're the real deal. You're not just here to talk to us. Or talk Mm -hmm. at us. You're here to talk to us. And you have the experience to back it up. And you dress like a hip-hop G. And you speak (laughs) with slang. Mm -hmm. But I haven't heard you cuss. I haven't heard you, you know, say something negative. You know, so that's where I kind of got that idea of, like, maybe that's the difference now. It's not always about the big, bright lights. It's it's about what you can do just right here in your community, man. Yeah, and is that – I was actually going to ask you that. Is that something that you want to get into more of, speaking to – whether it be youth or whoever the hell it may be, people yeah. going through drug problems, whatever it may be? Is that abs- into abs- yeah. Absolutely, man, because a lot of people there, – there was two things that started happening with people. They were either too awkward around me because they're like, yo, I'm, I'm used to this guy just being, like, wild. You know, now mm. this, guy's, this guy's sipping a beer. You know, it's his first one. He's been here for an hour. You know, before he would have been like 10 lines deep, 14 beers into it, 
and they didn't know how to take this this new version of me and then the other thing is people gravitate to me because they're like you know i'm going through it but you're actually like the product of it can be done mm -hmm. and they want to know what did you do and the first thing i tell them is like how bad do you want it i can't mm -hmm. answer that question for you only you can answer that question the only person that can let you down is who you're looking at in the mirror when you're brushing teeth in the morning so how bad do you want it because for me to leave Kitchener and go live in Toronto with my sister for 24 months and only come home to see my children, people didn't even know I was in Kitchener. That's how hard it was for me. I had to mm -hmm. take a go bus home, get off the go bus, cab up the street to Franklin Weber and spend two days in that house with my two children, then get back on the go bus at the latest I could at night so no one could see me and go back to Toronto. And mm -hmm. I did that so disciplined that when I realized I could do that and not get caught up in the Brads and the Jamies and the, and the, and the, the Byron's and the, whatever else was going on, <laughs> whatever. Like, yeah. You know, all these the people. Names. Yeah. Know. <laughs> you know, the, the, the more that I realized like I'm happier or there's not so much darkness over my life or there's not so much drama on my phone when I wake up on Saturday or, yeah. and you know, and then, you know, you have your moments where you, okay, now I miss the drugs. So then you, you start seeking it again. And then you, you realize that the depression is that much worse. Now you're older. You realize that the anger is that much more crazier because your kids don't want to be around you today. And Damn. this is, this is not cool. So even in recovery, you're going to have to slip up to realize what you're walking away from. And I tell people that all the time, the difference is don't allow your mind to say it's okay to do it. You have to say it sucks that I did it, but it's okay. Cause I'm, I'm alive and I can keep going forward. So, um, that's one thing that, like, you know, I really appreciate you asking me that because it's given me a chance to open up on like where I'm at right now. It's, mm -hmm. it's about talking to people who think that they can, mm -hmm. because even though, you know, I've been clean, let's say I've been off crack for. Oh, you six, were smoking too. Yeah. Six oh, and a half shit, years. Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Nobody did. I was a closet crackhead, man. I was in a bathtub with freaking sleeping bags and shit. You know? Oh, thinking spiders were crawling all over me and. Yeah, I was, I was messed. And then I uh, was off the coke for, so I had five years before I met this girl. And when she got pregnant, I found out what she was into. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I was like, I don't want to be a dad again. Like I, my daughter just started riding her bike. Now I'm going back to, <laughs> I'm going, there my, we go again. <laughs> yeah, my, my son's asking me about a car and his license. My daughter's riding a bike with a helmet, no training wheels. And now I got to go back to diapers and formula. Like I was... I was not in a good spot and I, I had a bad relapse, man. Oh, and it was shit. only because I was, I realized how beautiful pregnancy can be, but when it's not the way it should be, like I had no idea what she was into or anything like that. Yeah. So when I found out through the grapevine, it was like, you know, I, I got to go chase this girl down because she might be using meth while like pregnant. While being pregnant. Child. Wow. And I have no, I, there's no way I can protect my child until he makes it out of her. So oh. when Justin Hamilton got to that point, realized how helpless he was, the only thing that could numb that pain was cocaine. Fuck, okay. Eh? So uh, my five-year clean record was I, – I don't ever take it away from me because I went that five years, but the relapse yeah. was so vicious it felt like it didn't go away. And that's what, that's what had to happen because my sister had to come and snap me out of it. My dad actually left the pulpit from being a pastor and was like, I need to be a dad to my son, even though he's a grown man oh. now, you know, because – he started to realize, hey, my influence on you as a as a as a child may not have been the greatest. So, I talk to my dad all the time now. Like my dad will just show up at my house. He's he's got oh, yeah? so he doesn't do the phone call. He's oh the car's in the driveway. <laughs> Ring the doorbell. He's home, right? So, um, it, it it was it was necessary to bring me to a place where there's a lot more people that love you than you think. Yeah. And when you realize it, you you don't want to you don't want to sever those ties. So it just took away that awkward shame and guilt feeling. Mm -hmm. like, and was there, was there a part of you too, that felt like fucking, if, if you change completely, the people that you do think love you, aren't going to love you anymore because you're a different person. Yeah. 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 And um, man, that is a fucking, that's a tough go. It is to, to, to turn your life around from fucking, you know, smoking, sniffing, whatever it may be and being severely addicted to drugs. Yeah. You know, Jason, it got so hard that like, First of all, when I was lucky enough to, to buy this townhouse here in Country Hills, but it's on the other side of Strasburg. And I remember standing here saying, I don't know if I want to do this, man. Like, it's Country Hills, but it's the only mortgage I'm approved for and this and this and that. And 
oh man and then i remember having this vision of me and my friend tony roberts we used to say yeah, tony shit. yeah man we used yeah. to say you said we always used to go check the girls on the other side of strasburg because they had yep. the nice they had the nice houses behind lines yeah. arena and stuff right <laughs> so we always used to sit that and say that as kids like yo one day we're gonna make it to the other side of strasburg and when i had that memory i was like done and Damn. i remember um I remember moving in and I I was like, yo, I'm going to go get something to eat at Boston Pizza. And as soon as I pulled into the plaza, I got chills. Mm-hmm. And that's that's your, your recovery radar going off saying like, yo, this is a place where you frequented. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's be smart, Justin. And I remember pulling up and saying, this is part of this is part of the sacrifice. After I can't even go back to Alpine Plaza. You know what I mean? Because it's just it's just too. And this was like first out of the relapse. Like now I can I can drive there and go to Little Z's or whatever. But um, Little Z's, <laughs> yeah, Little yeah. Z's market, yeah, man. Damn. There's uh, there's uh, there's a lot of people, places, and things. I started to realize what that means in, in recovery. Like there's people you just can't you can't have in your life, no matter what, no matter what the memories are. They are memories. It's past. Yep. Um, it's never gonna change. Um, you know, like Brad and I were like, we were ride or die dogs, but you know, it got to the point where it's like, even in the headspace I'm at right now, having you at my daughter's birthday or something, then like, as soon as like the moment was clear, something he'd be like, yo man, fucking, you want to go tee one up? And it's like, bro, the fuck is wrong with you? You know what I mean? Like, like, why would you even ask me that? Why would you even ask me that? <laughs> And that's that's when it was just like scratch off the list. If you go through my Instagram or anything, you're not gonna see Brad on there. And, wow, it's, and right? this is you're talking 27 years of best friend. Yep. And but it was that easy because it's like I'm I'm sorry, like places. Um, again, like I I won't I won't go to. Uh, it's hard for me to go to see my dad on Kingswood because mm-hmm. of that. You know, it's where it all started. So. Kingswood Drive is a is is a place where I won't go. I won't go to like Gresham or anywhere like that. I won't, I won't go there. And things are uh, just like, like even watching certain movies. Like I can't watch movies like The Departed. I can't watch Heat. I can't because it makes me want to. You know, this mm-hmm. is what I used to watch at like three or four in the morning when I was just like by myself doing bumps. You know. Yeah, I remember there was a point like back way back in the day when I was fucking getting fucked up all the time. The movie Blow. I couldn't yeah. watch that. I couldn't watch Goodfellas because it got to a point like if I put on the movie Blow, within fucking 10, 15 minutes, and I'm on the phone. I need yeah, to, I need. To, it's not the movie's not the same unless I'm doing some bumps with it. Exactly. Right? Like, fuck. You know what? A few years ago, I went back to watch that movie, and it's fucking trash. I couldn't even get through it. I used to think that movie was amazing. Yeah, was garbage. I was probably just high every time I watched it. it was like this is so cool. I'm like yeah. Boston George. No, you're nothing like Boston George. You're <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, even cousins. Like some of my cousins, I was like, we always did the the weed, the juice, a couple bombs, then district. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it was like, you know, I can't even go to my cousins. And like, we're blood. And, yep. you know, my cousin at first was like, he's like messaging me and stuff. And I just told him one day, I was like, yo, flat out, unless you can come to my house. And don't bring any ganja. Don't bring any El Dorado. Mm-hmm. Bring a couple cold beers and some steaks. Yeah, chill out in the backyard and watch the kids. Don't even bother. And he, he like got mad. Like he, he was like he wouldn't come to family functions and stuff because he felt like disrespected. I'm like, how 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 are you disrespected by me setting a healthy boundary to protect myself? No shit. I didn't dismiss you from my life. I didn't say anything. I said, here's the things you can't bring. Yep. That's it. So. The more you do that, the stronger you get, right? So now it's it's it just is it's like second nature. Like even sometimes I'm scrolling through Facebook and I'll see someone say it's like post a picture or something. I'm just ah, this person needs to go. Bam. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's not it's not really it wasn't my style before, but you know I'm gonna be forty in less than two months, man. Like yeah, it's really it's really easy to hear your grandpa say one day you're gonna count your friends on one hand. Yeah. <laughs> you know you don't want to believe him when you're 12 years old riding your oh, bike with shit. 14 goons from your yeah. neighborhood <laughs> and here you are at 39 like yo i'm cutting these guys left right and center out of my no life shit. <laughs> no shit yeah man so that's that's where i'm at now that's what my music reflects it throws my faith in there but people listen to it that aren't even christian or anything they're just like bro this is some of the realest stuff i've heard 
just mm-hmm. because you talk about what everyone is going through at some point in time or has. And, uh, you know, my faith really allowed me to see that when you have a gift, you have a gift because the brain is the only organ in the human body that can reprogram itself. Damn, the only thing I didn't you know had, that. Yeah, the only thing you had to do was take out the, the weed, take out the coke, take out the liquor, mm-hmm. and listen to beats and learn how to write music again. And wow. eventually I got to the point where I was like, I don't even need a pen and a pad. Just press play and leave it on repeat. Wow. And by Crazy. the time like a couple minutes goes by, I'll be able to spit a verse. And there, and there's obviously, you know, in your past life, when you weren't living right, uh, you made your money through different avenues that weren't necessarily uh, uh, something you pay taxes on. We'll say that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now you're a, you're a chef. You said earlier you're, you're a, you went and did an apprenticeship and you're a chef. I see you posting pictures of fucking food all the time. It looks amazing. When yeah. did uh, when did you focus on that career? Uh, well, pretty much my whole twenties. I was yeah. just a, like a line cook or whatever. But yeah. when I got to about twenty eight or twenty nine. And mm-hmm. I saw the potential of money that that we could make. I, that's yeah. when I went full force and re- did the apprentice, like finished up, got certified. And uh, you know, I was uh, at York York campus for Seneca College, and I remember when the the interview was different. It wasn't like, "Hey, come in and sit down and talk." It was like I was at a round table with like a district manager, and oh. uh, yeah, and it was like you know, they're looking for someone that they can. In- invest in as kind of like a, ves- a vessel to run the ship right mm-hmm. it wasn't like just oh you're a line cook you're great cool you got experience done um and i remember when they said i we're gonna send you your offer letter and i was like what's the, like offer letter no like, shit. <laughs> and I mean, like, so i get this i get this thing in the mail and I'm, I'm reading through it and then it was just like everything that i needed to know about taking the job and then when i saw 80 with three zeros i was mm-hmm. like what <laughs> I was like, you're kidding me, man. Like I, and I was like, and then the benefits and then like the holidays and then like the, I was like, um, signed. And then, <laughs> Not like that record contract. eh? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I remember getting my first check and seeing the taxes and I got mad. I got hate so, that nice say eh? when you make real money and then you see your first check, you see the taxes and you're just furious. I got, I got so mad and I was just like, I felt like I didn't even want the job because the government was just <laughs> I'm going back to hustling. <laughs> Fuck this. Yeah. So um, I did that for as long as I could. And then when my son said, you know, I really want you to come back to uh, Kitchener, dad, like, I wish I could see you more. Mm hmm. Um, it was hard to walk away from, but at the same time, it was like, hey, you went from a dishwasher to an executive chef in charge of half million dollar con- budget for a college. That's insane. That came with catering to all these corporate functions and things. And you had to put together menus and price things and, you know, everything. And uh, I was like, I guess I could go back to Kitchener. But when I got back here, uh, I didn't want to do it anymore because there was no one paying you 80 K. Yep. You're lucky if you get 50. Mm-hmm. And uh, I said, you know what? let's just see if I can take my, uh, my experience to the other side of the, the food industry. So I went to the, to sales. I went into uh, Cisco foods. Okay. And I became a sales rep. And now I went from being a chef to being a guy that's going into the kitchen to talk to a chef, to get you to sign on with Cisco being your supplier. <laughs> and if, and you take your street hustle, you take your, <laughs> you take, you take that whole hustle and then your experience in the kitchen. You know how many people at first were just like Cisco, no, out of here, out of here. I was just like, yo, boss, man, listen, I'm just going to leave my card. But I'll tell you right now, I know what it's like to be you, man. Blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah, really? I said, yeah. And I would just say, I would say something about like creme brulee or say, and then mm-hmm. they'd be like, oh, you're a chef. I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, former chef. And I yeah, said, I, I, yeah, and I said, listen, my only focus is to make sure we can trim your food cost to 34%. And he just goes, stay right there. Like that, that was my first sale. The guy literally was just like, stay right there. Because as soon as they said from 40% to 34%, that's the bracket kind of where any restaurant wants to be mm-hmm. for your food cost. The next one is labor. So chef doesn't care about labor until he cares about his food costs. And once I had that taste, I was like, I can do this. And I was at Cisco for like three and a half years. And then I wanted to, I wanted to do something that was, you know, uh, 
more of what I was thinking and Flanagan's actually mm-hmm. now, you know, they started that thing from a station wagon and a fridge. Really? And 40 years later, they just built a $22 million state-of-the-art warehouse in Whitby to take on the GTA and Northern Ontario. Wow. You know what I mean? Like, think of that hustle for a second. Like, uh, someone's great-grandpa starts this and passed it on to grandpa, passed it on to dad, passed it on to son. Yeah. Generational wealth. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, I was sitting in the office and I saw this bar graph and it just had like the littlest green line. And then by the time you got to 40 years, it was really at the top of the page. Holy and that was, shit. That was their revenue. And I was like, I want to stay here. I just, yeah. I just, I like it. I want to stay here. So, um, I, I took my book of business from Cisco and I went back to all those, <laughs> I went back to all those people and I was like, yo, listen, <laughs> things changed. Uh, <laughs> I'm with Flanagan's now and, and they didn't like it at first, but then when I kind of pitched it to them, I was like, listen, you guys are owner operators. You're not a franchise. You know, yeah. you guys want to work with a local supplier. It just, it just, it just makes people feel better when they walk in here. Yeah, your produce was grown in Ontario. Your beef is from cattle from Ontario. You know, like, just do that. You know, you don't have, you don't have to do the big American company. And some people were, you know, I took a little hit in my commission, but you know, you just find ways to to get it back, like paper products. Like, you know, you don't want to get prime rib from us anymore. Okay, well, give me your toilet paper and coffee cups, and then you know, mark the margin up fifteen percent. Yeah, <laughs> to make yeah. up for what I'm losing. So. I still had the chance to hustle. It's just legal and it's food and it's all me. Yeah. And then when I'm done work, I can go back to my basement and be me. (laughs) So did you always have a passion for cooking then, even as a kid and shit? Yeah, dude. I was making French fries when I was seven years old. (laughs) Hot oil cutting up potatoes. (laughs) Yeah, man. That's awesome. Plus plus having the Caribbean influence, like, you know, seeing my mom make like roti Mm -hmm. and like my dad would make like, um, He'd make like custard and cook up rice and chow like, uh, like uh, curry salmon and stuff like that. So, I would always ask every now and then. I'd be like, "How do you know what to put in there?" Oh, you just know a little dash of this, a little piece of that. And I'm just like, <laughs> and then you get into your first restaurant job. They're like, "Here's your recipe cards." It's like, oh, I gotta go measure all this stuff. No shit. <laughs> yeah, so, um, I had that since a little kid too. Like, if I if I could, if if the risk wasn't so lopsided in the sense of failure versus success i would do a restaurant but right now i still want to do a food truck oh yeah i still want to get a a nice a nice truck and and call it go go guyana oh shit so i I was just gonna say what kind of food you're gonna be serving but now i got an idea i'd be like chicken curry rotis i'd be doing like the dumplings everything man like just post up at a church one day post up at this festival post up at you know but covid put those plans on hold. Cause I'm not going to go get a food truck and, and put myself in debt with the bank or anything. Yeah. No shit. Right now to, is definitely just, not the time. Yeah. Just to start the engine and be like, yay. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know so we'll, we'll see where things are after all this, but in a perfect world by 2022, yeah, I would definitely have a food truck. And what is, what would be like the, the go-to, what would that food truck be known for? What would be the one dish that you just, everyone's lining up to get it. To be completely honest, it would be my curry chicken, man. Yeah. I I make, I don't know. I just, I, when you eat it for so many years and then you look at so many different recipes, it's like, okay, this is generic. This is basic. This, this is cool, but it tastes nasty. It's like, all right, learn from all these recipes and then put your own experience into this. And I found out the key is making a paste. Okay. And basically what it is, instead of just like, adding the powdered curry powder and the cumin and whatever else you actually mm-hmm. like make a paste and it requires garlic onions a little water a little time and then you scald it in a pot and you like burn it onto your chicken and when, huh. you, when you do that it's it's this uh it's this terminology called bungeeing okay it's it's the reason why something can look dry but mm-hmm. it's actually moist mm-hmm. and yeah I, I make that literally for people all the time. Like I will get phone calls from just like my aunties. Like, hey, can you make a pot of curry chicken for me this weekend? Like, I'll bring you the chicken. 
<laughs> I was just gonna say, when we're actually allowed outside, we're not in any sort of lockdown. I think I'm going to Justin's house for curry chicken. Yeah, man. Like I love cooking. Like I have people over. There's times I look at my freezer. I'm like, yo, I'm gonna pull all this out just to have a reason for people to come here. <laughs> because That's one, awesome. I'm getting rid of meat before it's freezer burns, and two, I like feeding people, man. Like I just bought a smoker from Canadian Tire. Mm -hmm. so i got like briskets and ribs going now oh brisket i love brisket yeah bro like i let i let my ribs soak for two days in a brine before i even smoke them so <laughs> oh fuck oh i hope this summer we're allowed to see people <laughs> yo i will you know what uh, mark my word man i will let you know when i'm doing it up and if i fall as well come on by and look definitely on your way out the door man because i i it's i you know when you get to the stage you have to say to yourself Music can kind of become the second hobby thing. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be your like bread and butter, but um, if there's something I could do for the rest of my life and wake up at 68 and do it, it's cooking. Damn. And, and it's just because it's the satisfaction of seeing people just appreciate it. Like my, uh, my wifey's kids are here and they walked in the door and her daughter literally looks at me. She's like, Justin, are you cooking today? I'm like, yeah. She's like, <laughs> she literally from noon till five o'clock was just on me. Like, what are you, what are you going to start? When are you making? Like, <laughs> she's nine years old, dude. You know what I mean? And it's like right there. It's just another reminder that this is an impact you've left on a human being because they ate your food at Christmas. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, man. It's well, it, good food and people enjoying it and the right company. There's almost nothing better than that. Yeah. A few yeah. beers, whatever your whatever your pie thing is, with wine, whatever people drink, right? It's just that is just such a it can be such a good time. Yeah, man. So the music, what's uh before we let you get out of here, what's uh what's in store next? Do you have anything lined up, planned, your next move? Where are you um, at with that right now? Yeah, so I, I just put this project out in February. It was kind of like uh, pop up but september is my focus because uh i have an ep it's called there's power in his blood mm -hmm. and it's basically the darkest places of my history in my life that i have to go to okay to make the title make sense because for you to hear that and then see who's standing in front of you mm -hmm. you're gonna you're gonna only realize like it took this guy's faith to get here and uh, i'm so pumped it's only seven tracks um, okay uh, so I will be shooting two, I'll be shooting three videos in between June, uh, COVID pending, uh, in between June and August. And I will have those ready to go. And right now I'm learning how to do the radio hunt for singles, oh, um, because singles aren't dead. Radios are still playing. And that's where the, that's where the royalties are right now. Like the money. Okay. But, uh, yeah. So September, I don't have a date. I can say it's the month of September. Yeah. Uh, there's power in his blood. It's, it's the EP. And uh, I can't wait to put it out. Uh, right now, if you go to like uh, Spotify or YouTube, mm -hmm. type in Justin Hamilton, you'll see what's out there as of right now. But um, uh, this one is kind of like, uh, sorry, I just got a little emotional there. It, it's, it's, hey, man, it's all good. It's because a lot, like, it has to do with my mom visiting me in jail when I was 32. Oh, and, shit. uh, you know, she literally sat, no, I was 28 and then I was 32 and both times she happened to visit me on my exact birthday. Oh, and the, when I was 32, she said, you know, this is the second time I'm coming here to see you mm -hmm. after the doctor puts you in my arms and it hit me. And she said, are you even going to be alive at 40? You know, sorry, I'm getting emotional again, but mm -hmm. it's all good, you know, man that's fucking that's heavy she that said are heavy. you even going to be alive at 40 with the way you're going you have a little girl now uh -huh. and whew, makes you think may, right may 29th 2021 i'll be 40 and um to put an album out at that milestone mm -hmm. it's kind of like i'm jumping in but i'm bowing out you know mm -hmm. um all in one seven track project and I've put my heart and soul into this and I will not stop marketing it until it can't be marketed anymore. It's, was it, was it tough to get like uh, recording the songs? And, and yeah. Is it, is it, do you know what I mean? Cause you know, you get, you get emotional talking about it to relive going that deep into it and trying, you know, taking the, the different takes you got to do. Was it, is it tough to get through some of them? 
Yeah, it was because um, I had to go back into like a certain state of mind in order mm -hmm. to understand what I was trying to say to the particular audience I presume is going to be listening. And there's a song that's titled You Never Know. And it's actually me speaking to people as the addict. Okay. While also being able to speak to somebody else who's an addict. It's it's really crazy how do I have to explain it? So like for example, uh the verse says, um, uh, so where were you on Pongo's nights where, that we spent alone and cried? Spewing gossip, pointing at us with your fingertips. Well, maybe you're the one we hope still loves us, but you're ignorant, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm speaking like that's somebody's parent. You know what I mean? I'm saying this to you, like, mm -hmm. including my parents, like, because I say I include me in that. But then in the last verse, um, when I say, you know, your mom is an addict, you know, your dad's an addict, you know, your son's an addict, your little girl's an addict, you know, your boss could be an addict, your doctor, even he's an addict. Addiction is affecting in this life. Addiction is affecting someone in this life you love. Why not exercise your rights and give them hope with hugs? Honest to God, life is short, and yet you never know. A hug today from you, tomorrow might prevent an overdose, but it's not pro but it's not promised. Oof. So when you get to the when you write that and you record it and you kind of just like you get this tingly feeling and it's like i don't have to change anything about this song mm -hmm. it's like and i don't want to listen to it after it's mixed and mastered because it's that powerful wow to be able to to know that i'm at the point in life where i can say that a hug from you today tomorrow might prevent an overdose but it's not promised mm -hmm. it's almost like saying instead of being a judgmental person because someone's on drugs why don't you just show them a little love and see what happens? Mm -hmm. Because tomorrow's not promised, but that hug from you today might have them wake up tomorrow thinking different. It could stop them from suicide because I've had a friend take their life. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that all rolled into this one visit from my mom that said, are you even going to be alive at 40? Jesus. Yeah. So this is, this is uh, the project that it's pretty much my life, Jason. It is my life and I don't need I don't need 15 tracks to do it. I can do it in seven. Yeah, no shit. The, the days of double albums are fucking done. 25 yeah. tracks on a double album. Nobody even wants that shit anymore. Seven tracks, like seven tracks, 10 tracks. Uh, that's a solid package these days, I find. That's yeah. a nice little neat package project. You start getting into like fucking 19 songs or something. The album's going to go in so many different directions. You're not yeah. going to be able to, to to focus, especially something that important to you, right? Like if you if you drown that out with 15 or 16 songs, it's not going to have the same impact. Yeah, man, and um, yeah, I'm just I'm so excited for it. Like I got another song in there called Outsiders, and it's basically like me going back to what it was like growing up. Yeah, um, from like the black in a, a predominantly white community standpoint to also having to, to defend the fact that I. I go to church. I'm a Christian, you know, so I, I had to fight twice as much as the average kid growing up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's why people can meet me now in life. And they're like, yo, you're really calm. You're really deserved. It's like, yeah, because I don't want problems. Yeah. You've like, had enough I, of them. I've had enough. Like I'm walking to school, getting called nigger and then walking through school being like, hey, churchy, you know. Fuck. So it's like, oh, I got to fight this guy for being racist and I got to fight mm -hmm. this guy for, for bashing me because I, I was born into a, a, a faithful practice that might that come from my mom and dad. You know, mm -hmm. so when somebody has a problem, I'm just like, bro, I don't have time for this. Um, a lot of people, they always go, yo, man, you could have dealt with that. I'm like, why? Like, I, I used to go home after school and not want to go outside because there's a kid I literally saw visions of just smashing I'm not even 10 years old, you know? So I cherish it now though, that, you know, I'm going to be 40. I cherish it now that I have a son that has to come home and deal with it, you know, cause he's a bigger kid. Uh, I don't know if you've seen some pictures, yeah, like definitely. He, plays, definitely. he plays football. So he yeah. comes home getting called fat. So and stuff. Mm. And it breaks my heart. Cause it's like, yeah. man, like the cycle fucking still keeps going, man. Yeah. It won't stop either, man. It's been it's, going on forever. Yeah, so he got suspended for punching this kid out. And I, I looked at the principal and I was like, Do you are you expecting me to like react? Yeah, like, sure. my son punched a kid out because he pushed his clothes off the bench in the change room and said, Move over there, fat so and change. 
Mm. Wow. Like, you guys are only arriving at the point of my son throwing a punch at this kid. You don't know what he went through in elementary school. Mm -hmm. We're talking grade eight now. This is you don't know what he did in elementary school. Is that in the files? So you don't know what he did. All those nights he came home crying in my arms, and I had to sit there and deal with it, crying with him, saying, "Yo, your dad went through this. Mm -hmm. I just don't want you to start the fight. Please don't. I will never be mad if you defend yourself. Yep. But if you start one, you better have a solid reason. Yep. And when he said, "Well, dad, it, it hurts so much to hear this," I didn't even say anything to this kid. He just, I was like, "All right, man, done." That's brutal, man. Especially as a father, like that's got to be tough. Oh my gosh, man! Because, because he, he, he want to go find that little kid and break his fucking neck. You're like oh. you can't do anything. You want to you want to beat the dad up. You want like what? I there's nothing I can do. You feel like your fucking hands are tied. Hands exactly, and that's the that's the most rageful part of it. It's like mm -hmm. I'm in I'm sitting in a principal's office in handcuffs, while you're Jeez. looking at me like you you got a bad seed here. <laughs> like, man if 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 i wasn't a christian <laughs> you know what i mean like there there's some days where you know uh it, it, it's some days i just i don't care to hear what's going on in the world because it's like it's, it's just so a reminder it's so negative exactly mm -hmm. it's a reminder of my childhood i'm, I'm past that man mm -hmm. well like, you're not a child anymore you're exactly you know what i mean like we're, we're middle-aged men now that's fucked up to say, but that's it, man. We're middle yeah, man. man. It's like my my one year old son has more hair than me. You know, what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's just one of those realities. But I can joke about it because you're comfortable in your own skin. Um, exactly, and what I went through, I'm fortunate to be alive, man. I I really am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, you know, if it's not the, the the dope game on one side or the other, right? Whether it's you you're you're hustling, you're making something from it, or the addiction side of it. Yeah, you can easily end up in a fucking casket on both sides. Exactly, and I've already lost enough friends to that shit, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. All right, man. This has been a ton of fun. Is there anything else you want to get in before we let you go? Any sort of message you want to get out? Anything you want to plug? Any places you want to tell people to hit you up? The floor is yours. Um. Yeah. If you want to check out, uh, just Facebook.com. It's God's Music Now. Um. Again, if you if you do Justin Hamilton. Uh, on YouTube and on Spotify and Apple Music, uh, you'll see me pop up because I search it every now and then just to make sure I'm still the first name that drops. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, uh, Krill, uh, you know, you did that video with, with uh, Kevin. You know, Krill just had to bounce because he had to pick his girlfriend up and he snuck out quietly. And I was like, fuck, I hope it doesn't go back to him. Oh, um, yeah. But yeah, but, no, I was part of that process too. So I could talk about that if there's anything you want to know. Yeah, because I, 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 I saw DNA and I was like, yo, somebody's been watching my videos. Bro. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. We fucking reverse engineered that and was like, yo, who shot this? Found him. Krill reached out to him and hired him to shoot a couple videos. Bro, I, I won't look anywhere else, man. Yeah? You're happy it's, with Kevin? It's just the way that, like, um, the chemistry that we have, you know? Because mm -hmm. um, he did the shot clear one, but then when I came back and did Fatherhood Blessed and then Bang Bang, like, when I saw Bang Bang, I was like, this is the first time I wrote a script, but, uh, yeah, man. Um, no, I just wanted to give him props on that record, too, man. It's, uh, because I saw that and I was like, yo, someone else is eaten now because of... yeah of the advertising of my video and i was just like i wanted to give him that props man it's a good record too yeah nice as yet yeah yeah i like that one and uh, uh, it's funny too because i'm like Krill, Krill, krill's creating the music he you know he'll run things past me i don't rap i've i've always i've never even attempted it because i just love hip-hop so much i don't want to yeah. disrespect it you know what i mean so but krill like same with other people of rappers i've been friends with over the years battle rappers i've been friends with they'll run something by me and I just, I have uh, no problem being like, that's whack. Uh, and I, I have crushed Krill's dreams a few times. But it's not like, <laughs> it's not like he shuts down, right? He's like, sometimes he's even like, well, the hell with you. I like it. I'm going to keep going. Other times he's like, yeah, I kind of see what you're saying. Um, so it's fun being part of the whole process. And Nice As Yet is probably my favorite, uh, favorite uh, piece of work that he's done so far. Yeah, I didn't even know until that popped up on uh, my, my Instagram, man. Yeah. Nice. Because, uh. I remember meeting him years ago. Yeah, he said that to me because I asked him like last year. I was like, I asked him if he if he knew you at all. He's like, I knew Step better than him, but I've met him like once, and I, I know he raps and everything. And I was like, well, you know, if you ever want me to make a phone call, that, like just for you guys to have a chat or introduce you guys, whatever. I was like, it's no problem. Justin and I have always been cool. 
Yeah, no, I, I'm definitely down to, to do something with him because like he, it's, it's about uniqueness now with me too, with music, right? Like before mm-hmm. it was kind of like atypical, like you know, Jay-Z featuring so-and-so. It's like, yeah, okay, that's great. Like two rappers, but like you can have two artists on different paths, but saying something similar. Mm-hmm. I think I could do that with him. So Yeah, for sure. For sure. I'll, 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 I'll hook you guys up so you guys can talk. Friggin', and like I was, we were just saying before, you know, when this COVID nonsense is over, it's crazy how like you stay cool with somebody for so long, you don't see them. Like the last time I think we saw each other was when Rashad Evans was at Fear the Fighter. Yeah. Um, remember that right and it was i was I'm, i was there and like i was doing some work with fear of the fighter at like, the brand not so much the gym and uh and as i'm looking around the room I'm like what the hell are you doing here yeah. right <laughs> but like so uh, are, are you are you still doing that stuff no 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 i got out of combat sports like 2017 because what it became is clickbait and it was like trying to get like these you know just digging for bullshit stories and like this person's dating this person and Ron Rose, he's mad at me. She Tate, and I was like, "That's not what I do. I enjoy these these lengthy conversations, genuine conversations, no setups, no bullshit, not digging for anything. I enjoy that aspect of it, and it just wasn't there for combat sports anymore. And yeah, uh, yeah so a couple years later, Friggin' Krill was like, "You know, we should try doing a podcast sometime." When Krill and I first started doing this, it was fucking terrible. He has never had any experience. I didn't do it for a couple years, and then we brought Amy in. And got serious and started booking guests and putting real real effort into it. And uh, it's right back to where it was. And I love it again. But that's why I got out of it. Because it's just, it wasn't my thing. Yeah, I understand, man. No, this is awesome. But thanks thanks for having me, man. Like, uh, I know I know it was my bad last time. I hit you up, like, last minute. But uh, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like waiting, that's... like, four or five days. I'm like, okay, he's not confirming. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, whatever, man. Shit happens. It's all good. I'm glad we did get it done, though. Because this has been it's been really cool actually finding out more about your story than just what I knew for face value. Right. Cause these yeah. kind of stories you don't get unless you have these in-depth conversations. Like yeah. I'm sure your closest friends probably know a lot of this stuff, but like it's yeah. all news to me. And it's like, yeah, he's got a song with Chuck Claire. finding out how all that comes together. Right. Those are unique stories. They're really cool. And, and being such a big fan of hip hop and a fan of your work since we were in freaking high school, it's awesome to learn the, the backstory of all of it. Yeah, man, and uh, it, it was nice because it, I'm, I'm finally at the point where I'm comfortable to speak about stuff. So, yeah. uh, again, I'm so appreciative that you gave me the opportunity because uh, it allowed me to elaborate, like you said, and, and mm-hmm. now people get the backstories to things. So, yep, exactly. Fans of yours that never got a chance to meet you, things like that, right? They only listen to your music. They've never even been to one of your shows. Now they get a, they get to learn who the artist is. Yeah, man. All right, my man, I'll let you get out of here. Thank you so much for your time. Everyone, yeah. make sure you check out Justin Hamilton, Just Incredible. You got so many different platforms. I, I came across a marketing one today, too. You got a marketing team Facebook thing going on. Yeah, um, I, I post stuff and just get them to click share. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, a lot of them will do it through Messenger. Okay. Because it's more personal instead of like seeing the same thing shared like by everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So people are just like, oh, I shared it through Messenger, and they'll take a screenshot and they'll send it to me, and it'll it'll say the same thing over and over, like all these different names. So I'm like, oh, thank you. So and that's one way that I found out how digital marketing can work for free. Yeah. Yeah, man. Sure. All right, well, uh, man, you got a home here, so let me know. We'll, we'll hook this up again. We'll do it again sometime, and definitely when I'm, we're allowed to be around each other, I'm coming over for some curry chicken. Yeah, I was just gonna say that when this is all done, I'm you're, I'm, I'm making sure you're gonna get some food, man, because mm-hmm. that's the next thing that you're gonna be promoting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the food truck. Yeah, man. All right, Amy it was nice. Uh, nice meeting you here. Yeah, for sure. And I just want to say that I am stuck on the fact that I'm pretty sure that at least half of the people who listen to this show are going to be very confused trying to figure out what yellow pages are. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, don't make me sound like a fossil, but uh... (laughs) yeah, yellow pages. That's how we did it back then. (laughs) That is amazing. Nice touch, Amy. We had a good good line at the end of the show. (laughs) Yeah. That's what I'm here for. That's what you're here for. That's why we pay the big bucks. (laughs) (laughs) All right. For Justin Hamilton, Krill Kasatsky, Amy Barton, I'm Jay Kelly. This is the Build Downtown. We out. Peace. Peace. The Building Downtown. Building Downtown. Building Downtown. Building Downtown.